As we gather around God's word for this Palm Sunday, my prayer for you is this. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. I invite you to open up your Bibles to that second reading from Philippians chapter 2, the one that calls us to an attitude change. Philippians chapter 2, so 1248 is where you'll find that. An attitude change. Like I said, sometimes we look at someone else and we say, boy, that person needs an attitude change. And, and if we're willing to kind of be reflective on ourselves, uh, thank you, Nick, up there on the screen too, um, we need, you know, sometimes we need an attitude change. And, and many of you admitted to me in both this service and, in, and in, uh, in the earlier service, yeah, I need an attitude change. I do. There are times we just know that. Why is it an attitude? Because an attitude directs what we do. An attitude is where actions come from. It starts with an attitude. And when our attitude changes, it changes the way we think. A couple examples. I remember when I was in, remember when I was in eighth grade, I kind of, I, I knew I needed an attitude change before I got to high school because when I was in eighth grade, I was thinking, boy, you know, I'm, I'm top of the hill here, right? I'm the, I'm the big kid in the school here. And, and, and kind of, and I got to look at, I looked towards high school and I said, uh-oh, when I get to high school, I'm going to be down at the bottom of the, of the barrel, right? You know? And so I better have an attitude change because if I come in with that kind of attitude, boy, they will set me back. Like I knew I was going out for football and I didn't want them to hang me up on the wall by my you-know-what in the locker room, okay? You'd have to be a guy to understand that, but that wouldn't be good, right? Now, that's kind of a humorous kind of example of it. And I did have an attitude change before I went to high school because I knew. But there are other attitude changes that happen that are a lot more serious, Talking with Jerry and Tammy Bosco, for instance, who we've been praying for over the last number of months, when they both discovered that they had cancer, it changed their attitude and how they looked at life. Now, each day is a very precious thing, realizing that it can be changed so quickly. Many of you have gone through things like that in your life where it really changed your attitude and you looked at things differently. Now, Satan's in the mix there too, and sometimes he gives us a worse attitude or a more cynical attitude, or by the grace of God, God changes our attitude too. And remember what I said to you a couple of weeks ago? You should never walk away from here and be able to say, I didn't see Jesus this morning. Because the attitude that we want to follow is an attitude that we find in Christ Jesus himself. A great introduction, you're right, Jamie, in, in the Bibles that we have here, where Paul directs us towards that attitude. He doesn't direct us to some person or anything like that. He directs us back where we need to be. We need to have the same attitude as that of Christ. And so you go to your text there in verse 5, he says that. Have this mind among yourselves. In other words, have this attitude, which is yours in Christ Jesus. Christ's attitude is what we want to exemplify. And Christ's attitude is what we want to be focused on. Because when our attitude is on any other thing, then we see God only as an angry judge, kind of like Luther did before he discovered the gospel. Then we see only God, God saying, thou shalt not, and you shouldn't do that. But when we see the attitude of God and why he does that, then we see the heart of God. And we see that in Christ, who though he is a king, when he comes to this world, doesn't act like a king. He says, I came not to be served, but to serve and to give my life as a ransom for many. I am the light of the world, Jesus said. I am the living water. I am the way and the truth and the life. Come to the Father through me. There's no other way to come. He says to us, this is my body. This is my blood given and shed for you, serving for you for the forgiveness of your sins. That's the attitude. Have this same mind among yourselves, Paul writes, verse 5, which is yours in Christ Jesus. This same attitude. In other words, not grasping for things that might be rightfully ours. Remember a couple of weeks ago, we said we need to face one another. And the only way that we can face one another is being willing to be a servant to one another. Remember, we talked about how a little child, one of the first words that little children learn is the word mine, right? That's mine, to become possessive. And we'd like to think that that just happens when to little children and that as adults, we outgrow that. But if we're really honest with ourselves, we still struggle with that same thing. It's mine. I'm entitled to that. I should have that. 
Even if it means running over someone else, even if it means that someone else doesn't have, we have that tendency, we're sinners, to want our own way and to want what's rightfully ours. But yet when you look at Christ, that's not what he did. He did not claim mine. It says, go on in the text, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. A thing to be grasped. Now think about how graphic that is, because that's what we struggle with in life, isn't it? Grasping on to things, thinking that they're ours, holding them so tightly, fearing that we're going to lose them, and in the end, really losing them. We said all of life is a gift from God. Everything we have, time, talents, treasure, everything is a gift from God. And he gives it to us. But if we grasp that too tightly, like that rose petal that still has the thorns on it, if we grasp it too tightly, we lose our grip and we lose it. And rather than things becoming a blessing to us and then a blessing to others too, we end up losing it all. And it becomes a curse to us and becomes a curse to others. We want to have the attitude of Christ, who even though he is God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. Now think about that. Go back all the way to the beginning of time. And what is it that Adam and Eve wanted? What is it that Satan tempted them to want but to grasp for God? Satan says, God knows that when you eat from that tree, you will be like God. You will have grasped God. And they bit for the lie, literally. And look what happened. They began to blame one another. They were afraid of God and they hid from God. But yet look what God did. God did not leave Adam and Eve alone there. He didn't say you separated from me and now I'm separated from you. No, he comes and he finds Adam. Adam, where are you? God searches for him. And in that we find the heart of God. We find the heart of Christ. That we have a savior who's searching for us always. That we, despite our sin, which would separate us from God, he's always going after us. Paul says, have this mind among yourselves, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. Jesus lowered himself to be a servant, to come and to seek us. I've got some couples that I'm working with, and one of them is my own son, that are getting married here in a a number of months. And so we're going to talk about a marriage relationship. And you know, the world says a marriage relationship is a 50-50 thing, right? You know? But we know from a biblical perspective, marriage is never 50-50. Oftentimes it's 70-30 or 80-20. And sometimes you're the one giving the 80 and your partner's the one giving the 20. And then sometimes it's flipped around the other way. But here's the point. Marriage is not a 50-50 kind of thing. It's a complimenting one another. It's saying whatever it takes for you, my partner, I'm willing to do for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, to love and to cherish. We don't count. Like Peter coming to Jesus and saying, how many times do I need to forgive my brother? Is seven times enough? And Jesus says, no, 70 times seven. In other words, don't count, lose track. It's not about adding up. Or as Paul defines what true love is about, it's not keeping a record of wrongs. We're not counting. Jesus didn't count when he came to this world. He didn't say, I'm God, you should serve me, no. He gives us an example of true humility. His attitude, there's the word, his attitude was one of being a servant. And he calls us to do the same thing. He calls us to be willing to serve. And so in the stewardship of the things that God gives to us, we receive the gifts of God as a servant who's been entitled, who's been blessed with the things that we have so that we can be a blessing to other people. And so we look for those opportunities. Like the Good Samaritan in the parable that Jesus told, we're not surprised when God plops somebody down in front of us. When we see someone in need and our heart is tugged towards that, we are servants in the likeness of Christ. And just as Christ saw us in our need and came down to be our savior, so when we see others in need, it's natural for us to reach out. We have a different attitude. We have a different attitude of what we have and why we're here and what our purpose is in life. 
like Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being in the likeness of man. He humbled himself. He emptied himself like a pitcher that's filled full of the blessings of God, but doesn't do any good until it's tipped over and poured out. So Jesus did that for us. Full of all of the glory of God, he comes to serve us. He comes to give us exactly what we need. And he calls us to have that same kind of attitude. To look at our lives every single day as that pitcher being full with the blessings of God so that we can turn around and we can be a blessing to other people. Humbly so. And Paul defines that humbleness by saying he humbled himself to become obedient. Now it reminds me of a little bit of one of the things that happened yesterday when we were doing the journey to the cross. One of the, uh, a grandma had two of her granddaughters with her, a granddaughter and a grandson with her going through the, the, uh, the, the, the journey to the cross. And she said, my grandsons, my granddaughter said to me today, grandma, what was God like as a baby? Okay. So she's thinking God had to have a beginning sometime, right? Because everybody has a beginning. Everybody was a baby. Even you, Grandma, were a baby sometime. And Grandma's trying to explain to her, that's not true about God. God doesn't have a beginning. He's been around from eternity. He's going to be around to eternity. Now, I don't fully understand that. But in humility, I obey God and I listen to what God tells me. And when I read in scripture that it says God is eternal, I believe him. I trust him at his word. Even though I can't figure it out in my mind, I obey him. Just as we do again as we come to the Lord's Supper. Do I I don't fully understand what that means. I can't grasp that with my mind. This is my body. This is my blood. But because he says it is, I believe it. I trust him at his word. And so in everything in life, even when he calls me to do things that, that uh, I don't fully understand, even when he says, you can face death and don't need to be afraid, for I go to prepare a place for you, I can trust him. My attitude has changed that I've learned to trust the one who gave his son to be my savior and who gave his son to be a servant for me. And how far does that attitude go for Jesus? Well, it goes even further. Therefore, it says, humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death upon a cross. You see, if I were to ask you, if you had a choice on on how you were to die, I would guess everybody in here would say, I want to die in my sleep. I want to go to sleep and not wake up and wake up in heaven. Every time you hear about someone that that died that way, you say, that's the way that I want to go. Well, Jesus could have had a choice in the matter too, but he chose to die on a cross on our behalf. He chose to die taking the sins of the whole world on himself. He chose to go to that cross, even though he knew exactly what that meant, both the physical and the emotional turmoil of suffering for the sins of the whole world. And he chose to do it. That's the attitude of Jesus Christ, his attitude towards us. And he calls us to have the same about our lives too, that same attitude as well. And what happens? Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. You see, just as God exalted Jesus, and he did, God exalts you too. In your baptism, God said, you are no longer just a child of your parents. You are now my child. And he calls you by name. I am Matthew Dale Traster to God, as you are as well. And he writes your name in the book of life. And he exalts you as his precious child. And he knows every single thing about you, even the hairs on your head and the number of days in your life. He exalts you in that he sends you out to be a light to the world. He exalts you in that he says, everything you do, it's like you're doing it for me. 
And even in the smallest of things, what you might think is the smallest of things, I'm working great things through that. He exalts you to be his ambassadors to the world. He exalts you to go and make disciples of all. Baptizing, teaching, going in his name. And he calls you by name. And that's the attitude of Christ for you. And if you wonder, if you ever wonder, as you look at the world and as we wring our hands sometimes with the amount of evil going on and, 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 and evil people seeming to get their way, listen to the words that say, one day, every knee, that means every knee, even the ones who rejected Christ here, even the ones who reject God, even the ones that, that live contrary to him, one day, either here on this earth or maybe in hell, everyone will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Not because we convince them, but because they are convinced by the overwhelming evidence of the fact that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And we can live with that kind of attitude. That kind of attitude that says, there's nothing that anyone can do to me to separate me from the love of God in Christ Jesus. There is nothing, not even death or Satan, that can separate me from God. I can be at peace and have that attitude of peace that Jesus shares with us every single day and live in that kind of attitude and live knowing that we have the joy of being able to share that kind of grace and that kind of gift every single day that God gives us. So you know, we need an attitude change. And we got it in Christ Jesus. In his name, amen.